Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? This is Amanda. It's March the 6th, 2023. And this is going to be the second video that I do with JFK Jr. I channeled him about 12 days ago. And the first video is up on my YouTube channel. And the video is called Channeling JFK Jr. Always the Sun. I'm sitting here a little bit mind blown. I have to be honest because... I've just had a piece of information drop into my head from Spirit and if you've watched me for many years, you'll know that I'm not somebody, I don't think, that's always blowing my own trumpet. I've never been somebody that's come out and said I am the reincarnation of whoever <laughs> and I never will do that because I often actually who we've been in past lives is just ordinary folk, nothing wrong with being ordinary folk. Um, and there's always this, I don't know, energy of wanting to be a romantic hero or somebody very famous that, you know, we've heard of. And I actually believe that often when we talk about reincarnated souls, we're all a little bit of everybody. And I know that sounds very weird, but we have the fractals of everyone within us because unity consciousness makes that so, that we all really come from the same spark creation. Why am I going on about this in a video on JFK Jr.? Okay, what's come in just literally within the last five minutes is I was you know, conversing with his energy. I was trying to get a feel for which one of the knights of the round table he may have been, because I believe he definitely was one of them. I've also read lots of your comments, all of your comments, in fact, that came in on that first video, and I'll refer to those in a moment. But there was definitely a thread, some people saying, surely he was Lancelot. And certainly that's been something that I've pondered and wondered whether he could have been but I haven't got a crystal clear yes from him on that. And that's just because of the nature of channeling. Channeling isn't just about dialing up a telephone line and being able to ask them everything and getting every answer answered. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So he's giving me little bits of the jigsaw, not the whole jigsaw. That's what's interesting about this type of work and hopefully this type of video. So I was thinking, I think probably it's Lancelot. Maybe we will get some extra signs in this video that that is so or not. And then I was shuffling this deck, which is the Arthurian Tarot. It's an old deck that I managed to find in a vintage store. It's called the Arthurian Tarot. It's quite, I find it quite hard to read, I have to be honest, because it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's so ingrained with the story, obviously, of... Uh, Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, unless you're very conversant with every single aspect of that, um, you might struggle to interpret each card because they refer to the story. So it's a great training deck. And as I was shuffling it, I was thinking, obviously, it's called the Arthurian Tarot. So this is really Arthur's deck. You know, is it the deck that John wants me to be linking into with, for him? I wasn't sure. But anyway, I drew a card and straight away I felt John's energy coming through on this particular card, which is this one, the Spiral Tower. I'll talk about it in a moment and I will also, sorry, I'll talk about it in a moment. I'll also read the passage that goes with it. But effectively, it's talking about the energy of Percival. One of the Knights of the Round Table was called Percival. And I suddenly remembered something that I haven't thought about for a long, long time, which is that in my family lineage, Percival is a name that crops up a lot on my mother's side. And to be honest, I was all the only reference I've ever had to it in my life is obviously I'm a girl, so I wasn't called Percival. But I always remember as a little girl thinking, thank God I wasn't a boy and didn't get the name Percival. <laughs> thought of it since then and then just reading this I'm thinking oh my god definitely a fractal of the Percival energy within me I'm not saying I am him but I'm saying I'm definitely carrying part of his energy and then and it's like John's leading me to this um 
So, I mean, John may very well also have been Percival or a fractal of Percival, or maybe he was Percival or Lancelot. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll go on in this video in a moment. But it, I just looked up Percival and it says that um, he was one of King Arthur's legendary knights of the Round Table. In Welsh literature, his story is allotted to the historical Perida. He is most famous for his involvement in the quest for the Holy Grail, the embodiment of justice, and he holds the incredible power of holy light. Um, so the mystery deepens, my friends. The mystery deepens. I love this type of work, I have to say. So there we go. I, and I've, oh, my God, I've just done a video on YouTube. Sorry, I've, sorry, guys, I'm slightly blown away by what's just happened. I've just done a video on Instagram and Facebook about an hour ago. I'm sitting in my car by the sea and I'm talking about the power of our name and how we must claim the power of our names. And so I've been pushing away this energy of Percival, which is in my family line. She's like, God, what, what? I didn't even know it was a name associated with Arthur and the Knights just felt like really old fashioned, fuddy duddy. Who wants to be called that? Thank God I dodged a bullet with that one. But I literally an hour ago by the sea, I was talking about the meaning of names and the power of names and how we must claim the power of our name. And, um, and here I am looking at the energy of Percival. So sorry, guys, I'm just going to now <laughs> realign, <laughs> recenter and try and bring through this energy because the JFK Jr. energy is definitely one of exploration and discovery. And I don't believe that he is Q. You know, I said that in the first video. I don't believe he's still alive. I believe that what people are pining after is the energy of the man, the spirit of the man, um, which was extraordinary, which was a great, beautiful light on our planet. And it's that energy that is still very much alive and wanting to come and uh, help us to discover and live life to the best of, of our ability. But it's interesting, of course, that his name's been dragged into the whole QAnon thing because, it, you know, I'm not judging it, but that's very much about trying to discover and going down different rabbit holes and nothing wrong with going down rabbit holes either. But, you know, it's all about discovery. So, um, but I don't believe he is that. I believe he's dead and that's who I'm channeling. Anyway, guys, all very interesting. Um, let's go back a few steps, take a few breaths. And I'm going to just refer back to the first video that I did because I realised some people might not have watched it. It was a long one. It was an hour and 40 minutes. You get your money's worth with me. You don't even have to pay. How good is that? Um, but what we looked at in the first video was um, we looked at the numerology of his date of birth and death. We got into his transition to spirit and his death. Uh, we looked at his nephew, who is called Jack Schlossberg. Um, we, what else did we do? We brought through a little bit, linked into Carolyn. I was really felt as I was just getting started uh, with that video. So I'm going to pick up the pieces now and run with it um, and see what more we can get. Many of you in your comments basically were talk. there's a bit in the channeling where I'm talking about the fact that I felt that he had been a World War II uh, fighter pilot. Uh, and I also felt that he, he was that person who then reincarnated very, very quickly and came back as JFK Jr. And what I didn't know was what many of you then told me. And I'll just read out one of the many comments that came in. Um, this is from Angela. Amanda, I hope you're feeling better. Oh, that was my poorly tooth. Yes, I am. Thank you. As one of your American subscribers, I was interested in this channeling and wanted to offer information about a couple of the topic topics. First, you wondered about JFK Jr. being a World War II pilot. JFK Sr. was the second of nine children and his older brother, Joseph, Patrick Kennedy Jr. left Harvard Law School in 1941 to join the Navy. He was killed August the 12th, 1944, during a World War II mission when his bomber was blown up over the English Channel. I live literally by the English Channel. It's 10 minutes from, my, from, from my, where I'm filming this now. I really feel an affinity with JFK Jr. I really do. Um, 
so that's that that that's what I was picking up. It's just I didn't I hadn't linked who it was. So it's that relative. He was that he was Jeff K Jr. was this guy who was killed August the twelfth, nineteen forty four, during a World War Two mission over the English Channel. So he fell into the sea quite near where I am actually recording this. Comes back as JFK Jr. in whatever year it was he was born. Um, also, this person saying that you noted his nephew Jack has an interest in Japan. Um, and you're pointing out that his mother, Caroline, uh, was the US ambassador to, J- to Japan in the Obama administration from 2013 to 2017. So I didn't know any of that. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's really nice. And I really love um, hearing your comments when they're really constructive and helpful like that. And I um, know that you're going to help me piece together some of what's going to come through in this video. It's definitely a team effort because he's saying to me, it's all about the team effort. He, I've got his energy here. He's saying it's all about the team effort. For him, it was always about the team effort. Um, sorry, let me just go straight into this. I wasn't expecting him to come in quite so quickly. Um, I just want to use the spray. Hold on, guys. It's all about, hold on, John. <laughs> Hold on. Right. It's all about the team effort. So the team, he's showing me the Kennedy clan being the team. And uh, he's giving me the analogy of baseball, where I assume you pass the ball. Well, of course, you pass the ball from one person to another. Um, I'm in the UK. We don't I don't play baseball. I've never watched a baseball match. So it's football here. So excuse the rustiness. So he's just showing me somebody, which is something which is probably very obvious to American viewers. Um, he's showing me somebody running with the ball in baseball. And do you have to get it over the line? And then, oh, that's rugby, though, isn't it? That's rugby. I'm seeing an oval shaped ball. You don't do that in baseball. Was John a rugby fan? I'm picking up rugby with him, not base. Well, I, he probably liked both. Uh, anyway, I'm just going to go with that. He's showing me an oval shaped ball, which actually looks now more like a rugby ball than a baseball. Um, he's laughing and saying it's both. <laughs> he's saying he liked all ball sports, basically. So any type of ball linked into sport, he was into it. Um, earlier today, he was also showing me a beach ball. And he was taking me to a beach scene and he was showing me, you know how in the sand you can write your names or maybe when you're younger, you might write, I love you in the beach with a little heart. He was showing me that he did that. Now, I don't know whether it was with Carolyn or it was with an earlier love, but he just shows me this beach scene where there's a heart and there are initials. And obviously it's long been washed clean by the water. But I was shown that and I was shown the beach ball and now he's showing me the rugby ball and he's showing me the baseball. Anyway, the whole point of this is it's about the team. It's about the whole team helps either get the ball through the net or the whole team helps get the ball over the line, as in rugby. And the Kennedy dynasty, for want of a better word, the the Kennedy family all um, were this team. He's encouraging us to have the team mentality in our lives now. And obviously, this also references back to the days of the round table and the nights, which was all about team energy. So, John, um, I'm going to come back to this card. I haven't forgotten in a moment, but we're on a bit of a roll with team energy now. Tell me more about the energy of teamwork. In every lifetime, it has been important to me. Uh, he's taking me back to the lifetime as the bomber pilot. Um, and he, he was saying then it was a team, an allied team fighting a enemy. Uh, so in that lifetime as the bomber pl- pilot, he was part of a team, a group of pilots, a group of trained um, military men who were on a mission to try and uh, bring peace, you know, to defeat um, the, the Germans in the world in World War Two. So he's bringing in the energy of team there and the um, co- comradeship um, that belongs in times of war. Um, he's shown me, I feel like I'm in the bomber pilot energy here. 
because this is the thing about reincarnation. You can dip into somebody's soul in different time frames. So I've got him here as JFK Jr. as we knew him. I've also got him, he's shown me his lifetime as the bomber pilot. And in that war, it was very much about a band of brothers is what he's talking about. A band of brothers who went to war, who answered the call or were drafted up for something greater than themselves, for a higher calling to bring an end to um, the horrors of the war. Um, and I'm just hearing the word the band of brothers. So this energy of band of brothers, uh, loyalty, uh, loyalty being very high up there, having another person's back, uh, your brother in wartime having your back and you having theirs. Um, something about the formation in the air as well and the way that the planes would support each other for want of a better word um so on a field or on a pasture where soldiers actually fight war it's more obvious to see that somebody else might have your back that maybe a weaker member of the force might be protected by a stronger member of the army for want of a better word or he's saying that you form very strong bonds within the forces so that you um, you just look out for each other is what he's saying. You look out for each other. And he's saying the unspoken law that is there upon uh, the in, in terms of ground forces is also true in the air. It's just maybe harder to see. So he's just showing me something along that this is really interesting. And the two lifetimes merging now because he's showing me as the bomber pilot, there were other planes in the air at the time who effectively maybe had his back or he felt would have had his back. Um, but I'm feeling as though the, the plane behind him or for what I've got shot down first, maybe. So the uh, reinforcement type energy that would have been around him wasn't there. And he was a sitting duck is what he's calling it. Um, he's saying that when he was flying his final flight as JFK Jr. and he crashed into the ocean, there was a flashback memory, PTSD is what he's saying, it would be called now. Um, PTSD, um, this is really sad guys, it's as though JFK Jr. when he was, he went into that state of being disorientated, not being able to make the right call, there was an energy of panic linked into PTSD from a past life trauma linked into being the pilot, the bomber pilot who crashed. And it, it was all to do with he suddenly felt very alone up there in the sky in the same way that he'd felt very alone in the sky during 1940, whatever it was, when he got shot down. That suddenly the he looked around and... The, the, the people that would have been there or the other planes that would have been there in the 1940s because they would have flown as a squadron. He wouldn't just have been a single plane that went over, um, weren't there. And it's bringing back this energy of isolation, loneliness and okay. What I'm not picking up is that he deliberately crashed his plane as JFK Jr., but what he is showing me as the bomber pilot, when he became aware that he was completely on his own and sitting duck is what he's saying. He was he knew he was going to die in that moment. There was an energy of what the hell, what the hell to 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 go out all guns blazing is, is the way I would describe it. So, um, OK, so that's that's that then, John. OK, so we're acknowledging the energy of PTSD being able to um, travel through uh, different lifetimes unless it's dealt with, he says, unless it's dealt with. And he says, often you might be attracted in back into a particular activity or a particular type of relationship or a particular country even where you've experienced a very deep PTSD wound and you come back in similar circumstances to try to clear it and heal it. 
but I feel as though he didn't clear it and he didn't heal it in the lifetime as JFK Jr., but he's bringing it to our attention now. So what can we do, John, to try and clear these PTSD wounds then that we might carry, that we might not even be aware that we're carrying? Awareness is key, he's saying, to, be, uh, to look into family history, to look into the ancestral line, to learn more about who, where you've come from and who shaped you into who you are today because you carry the lineage and you carry the trauma and you carry the gifts of everybody in your family line. So he's taking me now to this ancestor I've got called Percival, who I don't even know who it is. And he's saying, go and find out who Percival was. Go and look at the lifetime of that person and what happened. And you'll make more sense of your life now. But he's saying it's true for everybody. It's true for everybody. So it feels as though he's going to bring an awareness to many of us that are watching this, because this is a portal video of maybe somebody in your ancestral line that for whatever reason you might have not been aware of, you might have ignored, you might not have been particularly interested in, but he's saying talk now to people that might be alive that still remember and still have either first-hand or second-hand experience to pass it on because he says information is power. Information is power linked into the ancestral lineage because when you know what you come from, you know what you need to heal. If you don't know what you come from, it's very hard to um, understand sometimes the psychosis that can arrive um, or the trauma that can arrive or the um, unusual feelings that can arise. I have a friend, um, everybody, this is me now talking again, just for one moment. I have a friend, she doesn't watch my videos, but the point is, She's one of my oldest friends. I don't think she'll mind me telling this story. But um, when she was in her, I don't know, 19, oh, 1920s. Interesting, I say 1920s. OK, I'm going back into her lineage. When she was in her 20s, uh, she went to a part of Spain to teach English as a foreign language. Many people do that. Um, it's quite common, uh, particularly when I was a younger girl. You know, a lot of people were doing that. It was a way to travel, earn a bit of money. Um, wasn't necessarily a career that you might do for life, but it was definitely an entry point into different things. And my particular friend is very, very confident. She's actually the person who I went round Europe with when I was about 19, interrailing. I would never have had the confidence to do it on my own. But with this particular girlfriend, I was able to. So very confident, very capable uh, young lady. And she went off to do her training, you know, people to speak English in, in, in Spain. And she was back within, I don't know, a month or so. And she said to me, she said, I just, I got there, she said, and I just couldn't settle. And she, she said something along the lines of, it felt as though there was a battle wound or there was something that I'd experienced in a past life that meant that I couldn't, I couldn't be there. And she literally fled from that part of Spain. Um, and so that's what I'm talking about. You know, for her, it might be, well, what was that all about? Does anybody in your family know what that could have been? Um, now, if there is no remaining relative to ask, uh, the answer lies in meditation. To go back, so using my example as an um, illustration, Percival, if I sat in deep meditation and I just focus on the word Percival or the name Percival and try and bring them alive, I will get a sensation of who they were. You can bring them back to you because they are a part of you. It's a bit like when you're trying to face different aspects of yourself. Just face the different aspect of yourself, the part of you that's feeling angry or upset or wounded or grief stricken. It's the same with the ancestors. They're part of you. So we can use a spray at this point, And I will just show you the one that I would recommend. And um, it's probably an obvious choice. I hope I've got it to hand. Have I? Um, yes. With. This is the main one. There's also a spray that's called Indi Midnight Indigo. Oh, it's here. Because the combination of colours is quite important. There's 
no such thing as picking up the wrong spray. I went to pick up the ancestral healing spray, which is obvious. It's one to link to the ancestors. That's why we created it. I was going to put it with Midnight Indigo, which is about going back into the void, going back in time. You spray the Midnight Indigo, you go back in time and you ask to be taken back through the ancestral line using this spray as well. And you call them, you call them. So for me, I'd be calling Percival. What is it? You know, who are you? What am I carrying still uh, that you carried? Maybe it is light, you know, maybe it is the energy, grail energy, holy grail type energy. I have no idea. But you have to call and then you receive and you wait and, you know, you ask for signs. But I also pulled this one, the Cosmos Elemental, um, which can't have been a mistake. So this is very much about the, f it says expand. Let me just spray this, guys. Hold on. So in terms of linking back into our ancestors. So for John, it's this bomber pilot. For me, it's Percival today. For you, I don't know who it is, but it'll be somebody calling them back. And the cosmos elemental just helps us to expand our awareness of different time periods that we may have lived, uh, different dimensions that we have lived in, including the energy of mythical time that I talked about in my last video. Because J JFK Jr.'s energy is very linked into this energy of mythical time. Camelot, um, Holy Grail, etc. Which leads me quite nicely on to looking at this card. Okay, I showed you this card at the beginning. This was the one he gave me today. It's from the Arthurian tar Tarot. And it's called the Spiral Tower. So this would be the Tower card in the traditional tarot. And I'm just going to read you the message that goes with it because it's pretty mind-blowing. It says, upon a high tour, so this is the tour in Glastonbury in UK. Upon a high tour, a tower is struck by lightning. Can you see the card all right? Masonry falls to the ground. But while the physical tower is shattered, a spiral tower of crystal remains. About the tour, the signs of the zodiac glow within the land. An owl flies overhead. And this is the interesting bit. So it's basically saying the tower has another tower within it, which is crystalline. It's etheric. It says throughout the search for the grail, and the grail um, was said to be the vessel used by Christ at the Last Supper. OK, so throughout the search for the grail, the questers encounter many dangers and tests. Only this is it. it. Only one seeker is destined to find the regenerating vessel in each age. Let me repeat that. Only one seeker is destined to find the regenerating vessel in each age although it is a quest which all seekers are directed to follow individually. The grail finder in the Arthurian legends is Percival in the earlier text. Later tradition gives the task to Galahad, Lancelot's son. His two companions are Percival and Bors. The grail is only achieved by the worthiest quester just as sovereignty only accepts the worthiest candidate for the kingship of the land. When it is achieved, the grail passes out of manifestation as a symbolic cup and becomes imprinted physically in the life of the land and its peoples. The cycle of change is seldom appreciated, being viewed as a catastrophic event. Um, this is apparent in the latter Arthurian cycle, where the achieving of the grail heralds the breaking of the round table fellowship. But though the round table knights meet no more, the concept of the fellowship remains etched in the land itself. The grail is withdrawn in order that its influence shall become operative and remain so. so. 
this is interesting as well, it says the grail winner also becomes withdrawn or dead to the world in some sense. Sometimes his physical body dies as Galahad does at Saras upon looking in the grail itself. In other traditions, it is Percival who wins the grail. He remains in the other world or on the borders of this world and in the other in order to meditate between the land and its peoples, becoming the new grail king. So I'm really feeling the energy of Percival and Lancelot, but also Galahad, who is Lancelot's son. So I'm actually wondering whether JFK Jr. is Galahad rather than Lancelot, and maybe JFK himself, the father, is Lancelot. <coughs> I'll go back in and ask him in a moment, but <coughs> just wanted to piece all this together myself. So were you sort of following what the book was trying to tell us? So in a traditional tarot, the tower shatters, okay, it's over, it has to then be rebuilt. What this is saying is that the holy energy, the sacred energy, the fellowship, the teamwork of the Knights of the Round Table, of the Arthurian energy, is still very present in the land. And it's interesting because whenever I've been to Glastonbury, I've never particularly wanted to go up to the tour. And I've never really understood it. But it's because, and I don't really not wishing to offend anybody, because I know lots of people love the tour and they love Glastonbury. Okay, so I'm not wishing to offend anybody. I'm just being honest with how I feel. It's as though the structure of the tour, it's like, yeah, okay, well, yeah, it looks all right. I suppose I could climb it. Because to me, I'm more, it's the etheric, the etheric energy which I'm interested in. It's not the physical structure of the tower itself. Does that make sense? So the physical structure and touching the, the stone or the brick, I mean, it's still probably lovely to do. But for me, it's more about that crystalline structure that exists in a different time and space and that I can access from right here, right now, if I wanted to, as can you, through stepping into mythical time. It's not really about the bricks and mortar in the same way that the Christ energy to me is not about bricks and mortar, wh wherever a holy church may be. Um, because I know that the energy of Christ is everywhere, in everything, in every blade of grass. And this is basically saying that the tower shattered so that the it could it could splinter and refract across the whole land, across the whole world. We all have pieces of it within ourselves. We're fractals of all of it. We're fractals of all of the knights and the energy of Arthur and all of the players at that time. So this is all getting a bit deep. <laughs> Very interesting, though. Hopefully you're finding it interesting as well. Let's now go back to JFK Jr., and see what else he wants to bring through. Yeah, because this is a card from the forthcoming Christ Consciousness deck that will be out in a few months. My, my Christ Consciousness deck that I've been doing with Jane. And this one shows a knight. And it says, Knight's Vigil, prepare and get ready. Because in days of old, you see, a knight would have to spend quiet time in contemplation and reflection before... Um, going off and doing his duty or into battle. Uh, it was a very sacred, holy space, um, very aligned to the God light, doing it for, for a reason. OK, so, John, where should we go now then with this particular piece of work today? So we've talked about teamwork. I'm also hearing the energy of fellowship. And of course, that does rather take us into fellowship of the ring as well. Um, whether it's the ring, whether it's the Holy Grail, uh, whether you believe the Holy Grail is a cup, whether you believe the Holy Grail is an energy. Um, it's something that is sought after in every single generation. And it links us back to our divine light, to the source of all that is good, all that is true, all that is honourable. And it's a noble quest. 
he's taking me to the bottom, sorry, in John's energy now, he's taking me to the bottom of the sea and it's taking me across now to the energy of water and things at the bottom of the sea. Um, also the energy of the lake, the lady of the lake. I was shown this by John uh, about a week ago, which was the energy of Princess Diana who I've also channeled, and I do believe that Princess Diana's brought JFK Jr. to us in this Heart Squad group of souls that I channel. And John was showing me, or reminding me, of the place where Diana is buried. And she's buried in her family home um, on the Althorpe estate. And it's a lake, basically, with an island She's on an island surrounded by a lake that nobody can get to. And it feels very much like the energy of the lady of the lake. The lady of the lake, I feel Princess Diana held that energy very strongly. And it's interesting because those of you that follow my royal <laughs> readings or channelings that I've done, I've done a lot of work in terms of who they all were and in terms of, you know, who they were in past lives. But I never got given Diana's for some reason. The others were easy and they just came very easily, who they were. Prince Harry, Henry VIII, it's obvious maybe. Meghan, Anne Boleyn, Catherine of Aragon for um, Princess Catherine now. William was one of the Georges, can't remember off the top of my head. You know, quite easy to see never got who Diana was. But I'm just feeling very strongly that she held the energy of Lady of the Lake. So again, another member um, of those ancient times, mythical times. And where do you want to go with this, John? He's talking about the Holy Grail and he's talking about the fact that it's the elements that can uh, dematerialize it and materialize it. So it doesn't matter where it is. It can never be found by anyone other than the person who is the rightful owner of it at any, in any particular incarnation. And I know it's a different thing because we were just talking the Holy Grail, but this is his energy today. It's a bit jumpy. It's a bit all over the place. I actually wonder whether, and no disrespect, John, but it feels a bit, am I allowed to say this? So I'm just having a little private conversation. He says, yeah, it's fine to say it. Okay. Because it feels a bit personal. I don't usually get into medical things with people, but and I know he's now a spirit, so he doesn't really mind because we aren't our labels, but I'm hearing the words ADHD. He feels as though he was a bit ADHD in his lifetime because he's jumping all over the place in terms of things he wants me to look at. And I actually, as, as the channeler, and as the person that's trying to anchor all this and make sense of it so people understand it, I'm struggling a little bit with his energy today. I mean, it's lovely, but it's a bit, he's a bit like the kite. It's just, he's all over the place. So um, we were talking about the grail, but now he's showing me the sword and, and Arthur. And the fact, of course, it was only Arthur that was able to pull the sword out of the rock. Um, and it was rock, which is the element of earth that pretty much hid the sword from view of anybody that wasn't um, meant to be able to see it. So he's saying you could walk past the rock with the sword in it and people wouldn't even know it was there. And it's the same with all ancient important relics. He's now taking me to crystal skulls and the fact that they are hidden and that they find their rightful owners in each lifetime. Um... So different artifacts, different things. He's now taking me, my God, this is, this is a bit trippy. That He's now taking me to Egypt, ancient Egypt, and he's showing me the Pyramid of Giza, Giza and the new secret, it's not new, he's saying, but, you know, for us it is, a new um, corridor that's just been discovered in the Pyramid at Giza that was always there. But he's saying now it's not so much that it's, it has been discovered, he's saying, but it's also the fact that it was allowed to be discovered now. He said there are powers of the universe that keep things hidden until people are ready to find them. 
So this corridor within the pyramid at Giza is very powerful. It's the entry into a new world, he's saying. It's the entry into an ancient world. Um, it's an entry into a different time, a different space, a pocket of energy that exists within it that is very bountiful and helpful for the world at this time. Now he's saying if the wrong uh, explorer goes into the corridor and expects to feel something, find something, experience something, they will be left thirsty, is what he's saying. It will be dry. There will be nothing there to see. They'll go out and think, well, you know, what was that all about? Where, it was dead end, basically. But he's saying those with eyes to see will find hidden treasures. And he's taking me to the, I don't know if he was very interested in ancient Egypt or just he had an Egyptian life because he's talking now a lot about ancient Egypt and Lord Carmarthen, who was the person who found all the Tutankhamun treasures. And there is, uh, this is me talking now, there's, there's something linked into, it's called the curse of um, the, the, the people that found all the treasures, the Tutankhamun treasures. There was said to be some sort of curse where a lot of them died in really weird and mysterious circumstances. He said it wasn't so much that there was a physical curse. It's the fact that they were searching for the wrong reasons. Um, they were searching for treasures linked into gold and ruby and sapphire, etc. But the true treasure that was to be found in that chamber wasn't the glitter and the gold and the baubles. It was the energy. And they didn't access the energy that was truly there. They got tainted by the worldly, materialistic greed, is what he's saying, that took over. And it was that that infected them. It was that that infected them, not the actual um, pyramid itself. So he's showing me the distinction between the intention and, and it comes down to whether you're in your heart space, whether you're doing it for the right reasons um, or whether you're doing it for altruistic reasons. People who are, there are two types of people in, the, in this world, he's saying, and those that discover the, the grail, because this whole thing about the corridor and the py pyramid is almost like an analogy it's an it's an analogy of finding a hidden chamber within, uh, which is your heart, which links into the grail energy. It's an analogy also about finding the grail, f getting to the the golden nugget, getting to the top prize. But you will never find it, he says, if you go in from a place of want, from a place of ego, from a place of... Um, yeah, from a place of ego. So, you know, wanting to make a name for yourself or um, so he's bringing me back to the energy of humbleness, humbleness, being a faithful servant, doing it for the greater good, doing it for the team. And the team includes everybody, not just a minority. OK. Okay, let me just come out of that a minute because it's really quite deep, this channeling. Okay, I'm going to put some incense on, John. And uh, not that your energy's heavy, it's beautiful, but just as the channeler, it can be um, quite tiring to hold it. So let me just have a breather. He's saying, of course. <laughs> it's got a lovely energy. He's also got, he's got this really intense spiritual side to him, very esoteric side to him, which I don't think the world saw much of when he was alive, but it was definitely there within him. And we would have seen more of it if he'd lived longer. And this very playful side as well. I'm getting a really strong energy of heartburn now. What's this, John? What's, what's going on with this heartburn? Oh, it's coming from nowhere. 
I feel this is linked into the reading. So let's just feel into what this is about. Okay, let's gonna pull another card, guys. Spear nine. Right, guys, I just took a 10 minute break, actually. I was, I'm, I'm fine now, but that was really quite something. That felt like an energy that came in to try to stop um, this. And what is this? This is us talking about the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is the greatest prize. It's the highest energy uh, and something not wanting to wanting to tap or wanting us to tap into its power. Uh, so anyway, it, it's shifted now. I've shifted that. I think probably for all of us, the card that came out as I was feeling all of the energies was Spear Nine. And looking up what Spear Nine is all about, I'm just reading from the book. It says, a turbulent sea crashes against high jagged cliffs on which a spear stands. Uh, woken from sleep, Arthur spied a strange ship <coughs> in which was the body of a dead knight. He learned from the letter in the knight's hand of the mysterious events surrounding the grail. It's about enduring strength, great reserves, dedication to an intuitive purpose and the wisdom to prepare against adversity. I just feel whatever that just was, I was picking up something which is linked into not wanting us to find the grail. Look at that. And what was I just saying about, for example, a sword could be in the stone and everyone else would have walked past it or not been able to retrieve it apart from Arthur, the rightful owner. It's the same with that spear. It's like most people would just walk past that not even knowing it was there. Okay, that was a bit strange. Sorry about that, guys. You get this sometimes with this type of work. Okay, let's go back into John and see what else he wants to say in this particular video. We've already covered quite a lot. I don't want to make it too long today. So, oh yeah, his playfulness. Okay, he's wanting to lighten it up a bit, his playful side. Yeah, I showed you the, um, I don't know if you can see them, my little characters that I bought in a shop. Um... Arthur and we've also got the knights but I was really I bought them and I thought what the hell have I bought those for really what am I going to do with those I don't know any little boys I can give them to and then um some one of you said I think that John used to play as a little boy with um knights and soldiers you know things like that toy soldiers and I did find a beautiful photograph of him doing exactly that so I think that's a nod back to his childhood actually OK, uh, let's just see anything else that wants to come through in this particular session. OK. The Knight's Code. OK, let's talk a little bit about the Knight's Code. So in addition to the energy of teamwork being very important to bring in unity consciousness, uh, also the code, the Knight's Code. OK, tell me a little bit about that, John. So he's going back to the thing about having somebody else's back and you having somebody else's back. He's also talking and reiterating what he's already said in this about the fact that we are working or serving for something greater than ourselves. Uh, he's saying that much of society is very ego led and uh, self-serving. But to serve a greater cause, a higher consciousness, a higher ideal is what's really going to help the world to rebalance and reset itself and provide the key for us to get into the energy of new earth. Loyalty, tolerance, grace. Steadfastness dedication, duty, honour, resilience, pride. And by pride, he doesn't mean egoic pride. He means being proud of something or belonging to something that has a noble cause, a higher cause. Um, 
Humbleness also comes into it too, though. Just seeing if he wants to show me much more today. It's fading out a little bit, so I can't force it. If it fades out, it fades out. It might very well be that this transmission is over. Yeah, I'm hearing like transmission over. It's like he's coming in and coming out, very much like a radio signal and giving information in pieces so that people actually truly hear it. Short, sharp burst, he's saying. <laughs> okay. Right, I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, okay, he might he might chip in again, I'm not sure, but I'm just going to carry on with two more cards uh, from this deck, just because I'm quite interested to see anything else we could get today. Um, yeah, his energy's definitely just stepped aside a little bit. So he's given what he wanted to do today, which is absolutely fine. Thank you very much, John. Give them, given them something to think about is what he's saying. He really wants people to go away from this video and think about the qualities of teamwork. Um, having another person's back, serving a higher purpose. Let's see if we can bring in a feminine energy here. He might, I think he's actually stepped back for a feminine energy to come in. We've got the sword maiden and the spear maiden. We've got feminine energies here chivalry there's an energy of chivalry with him i said that before if we look at this picture of him and carolyn chivalry um stepping back to allow in a feminine energy so i'm just wondering whether this energy is diana who i have channeled many times or whether it's going to be carolyn who i haven't channeled before let's just see what wants to come through who wants to come through Okay, I feel I have the energy of Carolyn. And, uh, okay, I'm hearing the word antagonist. Antagonist. Now, I'd actually like to look up, I know roughly what the meaning of ant antagonist is, but I'm hearing it so clearly, I would like to look at the official meaning of it. It says a person who actively opposes or is hostile to someone or something, an adversary. Right. And it's quite interesting because in this particular, because I was thinking, well, but she, I know she loved him. They might have fought, but I know she loved him. And I was talking about the union they still have in spirit. So I was thinking, that's a bit weird. That I've got that word. But can you see underneath here? Sorry, camera died. Uh, it says here, underneath the definition, it talks about biochemistry linked into antagonists. And it says, a substance which interferes with or inhibits the physiological action of another. LSD is a serotonin antagonist. I think she's um, talking about the, the drugs, which I mentioned in the first video. Um, I believe that she definitely had a drug problem. And it affected her behaviour. Um, of course it would affect her behaviour. So she's bringing... It's like she's coming in a little bit with her tail between her legs. Um, because there's an energy of what the drugs made me do or what the drugs made me become. It's as though she's not particularly proud of what she turned into when she was on them. And it's as though it's, it tainted the fairy tale, is what she's saying. But there's also something here about, um, we're going back to the whole Lancelot thing. I've just got this little book here, which I don't know, found in a library years ago. Um, and it talks about Lancelot and uh, Guinevere. So still not 100% sure that JFK Jr. was Lancelot, or whether it was just he was carrying the fractal of it. He was one of the knights. 
he's he's gone so it's like i can't i can't ask him i know sorry it's frustrating but it's just working with spirit it's not an exact science okay um he is by nature nature of the beast is he's a bit of an enigma this guy so there's always going to be a bit of mystery around him he's not going to give us all the answers so but the thing is if he was lancelot was she guinevere because this whole thing about antagonists, I'm just going to read you a tiny little bit out here. It says, Guinevere was Arthur's beautiful wife and Lancelot, one of his knights. The story of their adulterous love was the subject of many med medieval stories. Their love lasted for years, but Arthur was finally compelled to bring it into the open when Sir Mordred, the evil knight, made it necessary. As the adultery was tre treasonous, Arthur had to sentence Guinevere to be burnt at the stake in Carlisle. I didn't know that. Lancelot saved her, but in so doing, killed several knights and thus precipitated the downfall of the Fellowship of the Round Table. So she was an adulterer as Guinevere with Lancelot. <coughs> It's a tangled old web, this, guys. Tangled old web. Okay, how does this help us? <laughs> Today it might be interesting, but how does this help us? So let's just feel into it. So, Carolyn, welcome. I feel I have your energy here. Are you able to step forward and be with us and be present? Do you wish to? So in life, she was quite reclusive and didn't really want to be seen. She's still got an energy a bit like that, but I am feeling that she's stepping forward. And she feels very linked in to the energy of the moon. I'm feeling the energy of the moon all around her. It's quite like Princess Diana. It's like moon goddess energy. But anyway, Diana, yeah, moon goddess. Carolyn definitely also got the energy of the moon. I'm just seeing her in moonlight uh, with her blonde hair and very pale ivory skin. She's dressed in white. She's against water. She feels very floaty, very ethereal. I know she's spirit, but, you know, it's just... As a medium, you pick up differences in frequency and even if even though you're channeling spirit, they can come through in a more, um, for want of a better word, grounded, rooted energy um, with more physicality. With her, it's very ethereal. And I feel even when she was here, she's showing me that she never fully grounded into her body. This is something that is actually quite common that a lot of people don't know that we can incarnate and we don't fully incarnate, we don't fully, we're not fully present in our body. We're floating above our body a lot of the time. We're not, we're not rooted, we're not grounded. And she feels as though she wasn't rooted or grounded in her life is what she's saying. And the drugs made it worse. The drugs made her further detached, further um, unrooted from reality, from her own presence from her own life, from her own relationships, feels as though she feels that she wasn't really there a lot of the time. That's what it feels like to me. In the early days of their relationship, she was, but it's as though she just drifted out. Her energy started to drift out. Very escapist energy. Um, the reclusive thing was also part of that, not wanting to be seen. What message do you have for us today? Um, is there any message that you'd like to convey today? She's just looking down at the ground. I'm hearing the words lost innocence. I don't really know what that means. I'm hearing lost innocence. There's an energy of regret with her. 
very melancholy, quite sad. But yeah, she's got this very illuminative face and energy, but it's also very sad and very downcast. With JFK Jr. I picked up the energy of Icarus and the sun. And with her it's the polar opposite, it's the moon. But whereas with Icarus and John it was linked into sailing too close to the sun, identifying too much with it, getting your wings tinged by the intensity of the sun. With her I'm just seeing all this moonlight behind her but it's as though she didn't want to claim it or still can't for some reason. Sometimes souls come to us and they step forward in channeling and we want them to come out with all of these pearls of wisdom and truths, but actually they need healing. And I feel of the two, she needs the greater healing. She feels as though she hasn't got a lot to say, but it's not because she doesn't have something to say, it's because there's a feeling of almost unworthiness which is very sad because she's been dead for a number of years now and obviously in spirit there is healing but remember please that when spirits come forward to be channeled by somebody on earth they are reminded of the earth frequency I feel as though she's quite happy being pure spirit and then when she's invited back to a more earthbound setting and this type of situation and remember she didn't like to be in the public gaze and this is going to be going out on YouTube I'm not forcing her to be here. She stepped forward, but it's almost as though it's bringing back the energy of, oh, yeah, but I didn't actually like that when I was here. I, I, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's un, there's unhealed, definitely unhealed stuff here. So in a way, by her stepping forward, even if she's a bit in the shadows, we're helping her to claim a part of herself which is about see me. It's okay to be visible. And remember, she's a reflection of us. So she's holding an archetypal energy. And again, I said this this morning earlier on about don't, shut, don't hide your light under a bushel. Be proud of who you are. Look up. I want to say to her, I want to say, look up. I don't think she appreciated the beauty she had in her life. She feels very like, I tell you what it feels like. It feels like the energy, she's similar to Princess Diana when Diana was much younger. Diana transformed and grew as she grew older. And when she died was much more confident. Um, and she had got into public speaking and Diana would look you in the eye and she showed up in all these beautiful outfits. And you know, she liked being the centre of attention at the end of her life. But Diana in the early days was like the, you know, she felt like the ugly duckling. She was always looking down. She would never look you in the eye. It was always like this. You see the early footage of Diana and she's being chased by the paparazzi down the street before she even married Prince Charles. She's, she's like that. She's literally, she can't cope. This is what Carolyn's energy is like. But Carolyn never got the opportunity Diana got to grow and turn into the beautiful swan. And it's quite interesting that um, the, re the, the newly released tapes of the wedding of JFK Jr. and Carolyn have just come out or recently come out. And we're being given a little opportunity, a glimpse into that beautiful day. And, they, and she looks so beautiful. But again, it was all very hidden. Um, so there's something here about feminine growth and thwarted growth with her thwarted growth I think I'm getting the feeling from her that she would have she would have struggled to have come out of herself even if she had lived another 10 years she's saying that she was on a timeline um, where she was just getting more and more reclusive really needing really having to be dragged out into public the wedding that they were going to feels as though it was a real effort to get her there. She didn't particularly want to go. She just wanted to be at home. And it was feel it was becoming a very reclusive life. And it never would have worked between the two of them going forward because he was 
coming out of himself more and more. He was the sun and he was claiming it. Always the sun, that song, always the sun. And she's the moon, she's the divine feminine, he's the divine masculine, but she was just becoming more and more into, in, in, inward, but not in a healthy way. Not in a healthy way. Very sad, very wilting. I'm just seeing the swan with its neck. You know, like swans do that thing and they're just looking down like that. And they've got this beautiful face, but you can't see it because it's all like that. Be very. She had a very long neck, didn't she? Yeah, she had a long neck. So it's this energy of the swan. Um, okay. Carolyn. That fateful night then, when you did pass over. Okay, she's saying to me that she was, this sounds a bit disrespectful to say it, but she's telling me, I feel as though she was on something when she was in the plane. That might have just been some sort of tranquilizer type energy, or um, I'm, I'm not a fay with the world of drugs. <laughs> so it just feels like something that was like a sedative type energy so she feels as though she was quite out of it i'm just feeling like i'm quite out of it i think it's also why she lost the time i think they they um they got up in the air late because she was having her nails done and she was in her own little world just in her own little world detached from you know the mechanics of everyday life and actually come on carolyn it's like uh, two hours later it's going to be dusk you know you need to get up in the air but i'm having my nails it just but not not like an airhead not not it's more coming across from a place of trauma just detachment very aloof very detached very detached from everything but it's also about being very detached from herself very detached from herself and if you're detached from yourself you're detached from everybody else very lost i'm wanting to say to her what happened to you what happened to you to make you like that? What happened to you to make you like that? Just feeling an energy of depression, to be honest. Which is something that I do understand and I've experienced myself, so I, I, I can feel it when it, when it, when it hits me and I've, I've got a feeling of depression here with her. Um, doesn't have to be a reason, does there? Sometimes it's whether you believe it's a biochemical thing, whether it's something that's in your family line, whether it's been caused by something in particular, whatever it is, you know, it can come in many different ways. It's interesting that she, the first thing I heard when I tuned into her energy was antagonist because. There was something with her that just didn't. Fully connect in this in her lifetime. Um, she was always. Friction, there was always friction, different parts of herself, unhealed parts of herself, friction. Um, I think she could be quite antagonistic in some way, especially with him. Uh, hostile energy, but it came from a place of wounding. Look at your behaviour, she's saying with others. She's showing me a mirror now. She's showing me a mirror. Look at the mirror reflection. How you treat others is always a reflection of how you feel about yourself and how you feel you deserve to be treated also. Um, I don't know whether as a younger woman she had a lot of psychotherapy or counselling I'm sort of being drawn into that world because it's interesting with her. You can almost sometimes have too much of a good thing. It can almost become a bit navel gazing and very self-absorbed, very, it's all about me and how I feel. In some circumstances, please don't get triggered. I'm not talking about you and your life. I'm talking about her and how I'm feeling about her. I'm just feeling as though it's just very insular. If 
feels a little bit narcissistic, to be honest, and that's a very strong word, but it's the word that I'm getting with the energy. It's sad, whatever it is, it's not, it's not great. Okay, I'm going to pull a card for her. I'm going to pull it from... I'll just put it from a traditional tarot deck, I think. Carolyn. Yeah. She's definitely in a space of healing. Definitely in a space of healing. And she's healing via this forum, really, and this airing, um, her relationship with her knight. Healing what went, what occurred with her knight. Temperance. She didn't find balance in her life. She was seeking it all of the time, but she was looking in the wrong place. She was looking in the wrong place. She was looking in the wrong cup. I don't know if there was an issue with drink as well. I feel as though there might have been drink and drugs. She just feels unbalanced. And she's still requiring healing. So let's give her that. And let's also see ourselves maybe in part in some of what she's carrying. Because if we can help heal her and the energy she represents, we help heal ourselves. Anything else to say, Carolyn? Are you able to speak through these cards for me? Give a message, please, through these cards for me. Two cards I'm hearing. Please give a message through these cards for me. The Queen of Pentacles is what she wanted to be. She wanted to be this grounded queen, but I don't feel that she was. Don't feel she was grounded, I said that at the start. She want, yeah, she wanted to be clear. She wanted to be, she had an ability to be sharp, analytical, a clear thinker, but towards the end she wasn't, she was very muddled. She wants us to get help her get back to this energy of the Queen of Pentacles, but also it's for us to get into that space of being the grounded queen, the grounded queen, um, the clear-sighted queen. There's a very twin flame energy with her and JFK Jr. So if we look at it from that perspective, the divine feminine, which is what she represents, feels a bit lost and all at sea, excuse the pun. And that's what she became. She became lost and all at sea. She became lost at sea. How she was feeling was the reality that that's how she ended, lost at sea. Fortunately found, but she was lost for five days. Um, so the divine feminine energy here is not feeling grounded, is not feeling clear, um, but wants to be. Trying to find the balance Anything else about the divine feminine energy that Carolyn represents? Yeah. It's just very sad. Sad. Five of cups, lost. Nobody saw that she was drowning. I mean, maybe they did, but maybe they tried to help, but there's a thing about you can't help anybody that doesn't want to be helped. She felt like she was drowning. I mean, I'm talking about in her life. And nobody was seeing it. Nobody wanted to see it. They wanted the fairy tale. They wanted the fairy tale. It's very Princess Di and Prince Charles as well. The whole thing that nobody saw that Diana was crying out for help during her marriage to Charles. Very unhappy um, lady. Nobody wanted to see that. They wanted to see Princess Diana, you know, the happy princess, the fairy tale, very similar with Carolyn. Nobody wanted to see this other side to her, so she kept it hidden. Do you know what it feels like? Yeah, do you know what this feels like? It almost feels as though it's lovely to have been in John's company, and I'm sure we're going to come back to his company. 
but it's almost as though all of this work over the last couple of videos has been about him bringing her to us. It's as though he, he, as the divine masculine, is bringing forward the wounded divine feminine, the six of the six of pentacles, for energy exchange, to get towards the six of um, wands, which is victory. Six six. No, not a bad number. A very grounded number about the material world balancing it all out six of pentacles balancing it all out who's particularly out of balance the divine feminine i mean not saying the masculine is completely <laughs> not got anything going on with but in this reading it's the it, he, he john is bringing carolyn back for healing what he couldn't give her when she was alive or for whatever reason he might have tried but he didn't succeed because she didn't want to be helped. It's as though she's now coming forward wanting to be helped. And he's the one that's brought her to this door, to us. And she represents us. She represents the female that can't look up, that can't, that can't face the world is what he's saying. He's back now, he says she couldn't face the world. And in many ways, I was forcing her to face the world. But equally, John, that's a bit harsh because she married you knowing who you were in the same way that Diana married Charles knowing who he was, <laughs> you know? John's saying, I'll accept that. Okay, so he doesn't, it's, it's not your fault. It's just a dynamic that was playing out. Somebody who wasn't ready to face the world was put into a position where they absolutely had to. So we're going to heal that, but we're healing our ability to be able to face the world. Yeah. So let me just feel the energy of both of them together now as we close out this video. Let's see what they want to show me. I'm seeing a circle, which you could call a porthole, but it just looks like a circular window as though we're looking through a snapshot of time. I'm seeing them dancing. And again, I've got Princess Diana and Prince Charles. They carry a template. Carolyn and JFK Jr. carry a template. Um, this, is, this is definitely soulmate, twin flame energy. Uh, divine masculine, divine feminine. I'm seeing them dancing. They probably danced at their wedding. I haven't actually watched the Lost tape, so I don't know. But I'm assuming they danced at their wedding. And I'm seeing the, that thing where the woman, I think the man does. Who does the thing where you have to twirl and go underneath somebody's arm? That, all that type of thing, you know? Um, very elegant, very, you know, all this type of thing. Uh, I'm seeing them do that. But it's as though I'm seeing them do that now. It's like they're dancing in the twilight. They're dancing in the sunlight. They're dancing in the moonlight. It's important. They're dancing in the sunlight and they're dancing in the moonlight. It's combined energy. And now I'm being shown Princess Diana and she was on the dance floor. But it's not Prince Charles that she was dancing with because he wasn't her divine counterpart. He was a karmic, probably, or no, let's not even get into that. He was just her partner. He was her. He was the partner who was meant to give her the children. But the point is that what I'm seeing is Diana on the dance floor, whether it was either John Travolta or Wayne Sleep. No, I'm not saying Wayne Sleep or John Travolta was her divine counterpart. It's the fact that they were having to fill in for the fact that her divine partner wasn't there. But I'm also now seeing Diana and it's like she's dancing on her own. Better to dance on your own, Diana is saying, than dance with the wrong one. <laughs> dance with the wrong person. So this, we're, en we're ending on this energy of dance and now I'm being taken back to times of old and days of court, court days in, in the uh, Knights of the Round Table type era and dancing and I'm being shown people dancing on tables and the thing where they used to do that where you, you know, men and partners and they were like that and then somebody would go underneath the arch, go on underneath the arch it's almost like a country, it's not country dancing. They used to do it in old times as well, medieval times, uh, not just round table and King Arthur times, but I'm now being shown medieval times. 
I'm sure it happened in many countries, but certainly in my own country, in a court of the king and queen, there would be the, this beautiful dancing and feasting. And I'm just being shown that thing where, yeah, you you form an arch of people and then you go underneath the arch and come out again and all of that. And it seems to be about celebration and unity and joy. Princess Diana loved dancing. I don't know whether Carolyn loved dancing because I'm picking up dance, dance. Um... Maybe she did, maybe she didn't, but I'm definitely picking up the energy of dance with Diana and I think probably Carolyn as well. The High Priestess. And the world. And the Queen of Wands. Do you know what I think Carolyn represents as well? I'm feeling an energy here of what could have been um potential look at this the high priestess and the queen of cups but the world is in the middle it all got completed and ended before she was able to step into her full power so as she steps more fully into her power and spirit and grows in strength we can mirror that down here we can help each other out, basically, is what I'm trying to say. John feels the more secure, stable, uh, happy, healthy, healed person here. Person, spirit. Let me go back to John. Because he's back again now. It's like he wanted to just to give her her moment. And her space. He says, I needed to give her her space. That's why I had to step back from this session temporarily. He says apologies. <laughs> He's so polite. Um, it's just this thing about giving her her space. I think he tried to do that in life as well, giving her her space. I think he would have done anything to try and preserve the marriage, actually, even if it came to separate living arrangements. Or maybe they were living separately. I'm not sure, but I'm just showing, I'm being shown giving her her space. Um... Okay, any final message for today, John? I feel as though we've probably uh, done enough in this video uh, for today. It's always a joy to speak to you, and I'm sure we're going to come back to more. Um, I'm going to look into the energy of Percival and find out a bit more about him. I'm going to claim that fractal as part of myself, and that I too hold the energy of the knight, knights of the round table, particularly linked into that knight. And he's saying for the people watching that you're all fractals of one of the knights. Um, which one do you particularly identify with? Which one do you, yeah, which one do you particularly identify with? Or, you know, one of the other players, um, as I say, Gwen Guinevere, we have the Lady of the Lake, which is Diana. Um, it's time to revisit those old stories because they can teach us more about who we actually are. Mm. Okay. Right, guys, I'm going to leave it there because my stomach's rumbling. If you can hear that on video, apologies. <laughs> Let's just pull uh, one final card, I think. Can't resist. The Grail Hermit. The Grail Hermit. Who was he then? Number nine. Number nine. It's good to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know if this deck is still available, but if it is, the Arthurian Tarot, um, it's a good one to just sort of try to wrap your head around some of the players and the stories and the mythology. Um, what is the main point of the hail of the hail the grail hermit he represents the keeper and the transmitter of esoteric law neither druid nor priest as hermit he meditates the functions of both his book is open to all who go on quests um, so it's the
So I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, I'll be back soon. I hope you enjoyed that video. Take great care of yourself and I'll see you again soon. Lots of love. Please like and share the video to get it out to as many people as possible. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carolyn. Take care. Bye.